Um, it's a delight to be here, and I'm so impressed. I'm on the program here with two mayors, and uh, it's a hard act to follow. It's delightful to see somebody who's giving back to a community based on his opportunities and what he's had to overcome. But I want to talk about what Mother Nature has to overcome and some of how we play in a, a crucial role in all of that. So I think I will, I'd like to darken the room slightly if we could, get these pictures as bright as possible. And we'll be talking about eco-friendly landscapes and how to be better stewards for Mother Nature. And uh, as a few more people are trickling in, I'll just ask the smarties in the roo room who are here, what's not nature friendly? What's not ecologically right about this picture? The grass going down to the lakeside. You know, absolutely. I, I put this together a long time ago, parts of it, and I've loved that lake picture. But that's not eco friendly, having the grass go right down to our lake, is it? So we'll talk about what's good, bad, and not so good, about how the paradigm has developed in America, what is a landscape and garden, and what might be a little bit different if we do it with much more responsibility. Let's see what happens when I do this. Okay. Okay, we can sell nature-friendly landscaping. We can sell the idea of ecologically friendly gardens if you talk to people about birds and butterflies. Everybody loves birds and butterflies. Some of the rest of the nature things, the snakes and the spiders and even the deer and the bunnies eating your tulips, all of that isn't quite as good a sell. But we need to step farther back and look at big pictures, look at great big pictures. Now here's the American landscape uh, typical, isn't it? I mean, that's what, if you go to the professional landscape community and say, I want a landscape in my suburban home, they're trying to sell you something like this, which has almost no natural value whatsoever. That landscape is not doing any darn good to a frog, toad, bird, butterfly, and the monoculture that's a lawn is probably doing potential harm to our world by requiring excessive uh, water use if people want to have it all green like the commercials look, um, all of those wonderful uh, fertilizer commercials look. And uh, the lawn often seems to tell people they should use pesticides and excess fertilizers that run off into that lake we were looking at. So in many ways, this is not what we're going for and we gardeners especially, and civic leaders, need to change the paradigm. Why, some of why is, there isn't much real habitat left. If the suburbanites and the city folks with great gardens say, you know, let's, let's let all that natural stuff be out in the country, uh, the truth is there isn't much country left. The country is divide, d disappearing rapidly. 85% or more of the people live in suburbs without a field or forest in sight. Kids don't play in the forests anymore. And uh, we probably, I mean, that's back in the woods where I grew up, but how many of your kids and grandchildren actually play in the woods how many have ever played in the woods alone? Kids today don't get to play alone. Uh, most of them are supervised 24-7 in organized activities. And uh, that's a whole different set of youth that we have that aren't growing up saying, oh, look at that insect, look at that bird, isn't this cool, climbing a tree. I fell out of a lot of trees, which many people think explains a lot about the, my, how my life went. But. Uh, it's a good thing to fall out of a tree, to a point. Um, but the truth is, there aren't the woods, there aren't the uh, fields for the kids to explore, and there aren't the woods in the fields for the rest of the critters. Two million a acres a year we lose to development. Suburbia up how many thousand times since 1960. Uh, we know this is happening, and it is a rather dismal picture. And 43,000 square miles of uh, acre, square acres in square miles of paved surfaces in America.
Can you think about just the fact of pavers? Cities are one great big paved area. What about the water runoff from the cities? There are movements, there are green roofs, there are permeable pavers being marketed. There are great movements, there's uh, rain gardens and, and bio strips, but it's a dent. And I appreciated our master gardener, one of our, our, our awardees this morning who said, time is running, time is, we don't have enough time. We need to do something really soon. And the more we have that, this is the really sad part of the program, the more we have that urban sprawl, the habitat depletion, we get species extinction. Uh, they simply don't have enough uh, space and land and places to breed and be what they are. And it's not just that there isn't the total acreage for our various creatures to live in, it's the density factor. It's the fact that some birds need 10 square miles in which to set up their lives and communities. They can't be at the edge of a forest because the predators live at the edge of the forest. How ecology works is very, very complex. And so the density factor, 85% of our forests are gone. Two out of three woodland birds are in decline. And now where are they going to go for the nesting? And where are they going to go for the pollen? Where are even the outbuildings? Even the lack of barns. Barns in New York State. There's not that many of the dear old barns, and all the properties don't have outbuildings, sheds, places that barn swallows and some kinds of owls lived. Uh, and if you don't have that, you don't have the, the owl there catching that mice. That's an actual photograph. Before they did Photoshop, some photographer set up in that barn and waited for an owl to come down and land catching a mouse. So hail to the photographers. So the imbalance among prey and predators, these are some of the very discouraging things we're up against. And then take away lots of habitat, and then what are we going to crowd it with? Alien plants. I saw a lot of displays downstairs that were all about the, from the giant hogweed to uh, many of the other invasive species, even the uh, feral boar, wild boars. Uh, species have come into our terrain that don't belong here, and if they don't belong here, they don't have natural enemies that keep them in check. Uh, we can, in Japan, they can deal with a Japanese beetle fine, but here it's a pest that caused many people to run to the store and get some pesticide product to kill it. So we need not encourage the alien species, and I believe that I'm talking to the believers here who know what some of them are, the purple loose strife, the, uh, the uh, phragmites, Look at the, we've, we've lost two times the state of Delaware to invasive species taking over. And when some invasive species take over, not even a frog can live there. In a field, there's 40 acres somewhere in Minnesota of that uh, Phragmites, that reed grass, and not a frog in sight can live. There's no good food there for anything worthwhile that we want to support. And uh, there's the Japanese not, uh, knotweed, polygonatum, in the upper right. Truth is, if we're trying to sell to the general public, though, and I work in a garden center a couple days a week and do some consulting, 93 or 4% of what we plant in America, ornamentally, is non-native. So we, we think we're going to sell the world to try to replace habitat and have all native plants that horse is out of the barn. It's not going to happen. 93% of what people buy and sell is non-native. And, you know, that's okay. Here's a beautiful front yard in Amherst, New York, a fairly uh, pr uh, rich suburb. And almost none of those plants in her front yard are native. They are certainly helping pollinators. There's fl flowering going on from spring through fall. It's not a great big green front lawn like that opening slide I showed, but it still isn't uh, helping some of the species. I have a different talk, by the way, called Beyond the Barberry, 
that I have been giving to landscape organizations around New York State. And it's not a popular talk. If you try to go to landscapers and tell them, you're not supposed to sell barberry, burning bush, uh, some of the honeysuckles, Norway maples. If you tell the landscapers, you shouldn't do this anymore, and they say, hey, you, you run a nursery. You try to make a living this way. Uh, I have 10 years invested in growing these trees, and I bought 10,000 of this kind of plant, and people demand barberries. I have to sell them. So try to tell that. Uh, Diana Weiner, cooperative extension people, master gardeners, have been telling people for 10, 20 years now how we shouldn't sell or buy or use these invasive plants of New York State. But it's a hard sell when you're doing it just on the basis of should. Well, guess what? There's a big legislation coming. Many of these plants are going to be banned in New York State within this year. Aha! See, I am preaching to the believers. And this law, you should hear the landscape community buzz. I've been on a statewide steering committee talking about the landscaper response to the proposed banned plants. And they want to fight for some of these plants. and. You know, I'll try to be the mediating voice and say, yes, but the problem with a barberry is the deer eat it and poop it, and then you have a seed with a fertilizer, and there it is all over the fields, and if you don't see it in western New York, you can sure hike around Ithaca or the Hudson Valley and see entire fields crowded with barberries instead of plants that should be there because some bird needs that other plant for its nesting space or some other complicated thing. And as I say, ecology is complicated. It's very hard to tell some of these folks that it's not obvious to you the harm this plant is doing, but it's all interrelated. It all works together. So anyway, I've been given that unpopular talk, and I will show you some of the plants I'm trying to tell these folks, and this is the part I can sell, that some of these plants are, that there's really good alternatives, both native and non, or cultivars of natives. Now here's the question for you, who I suspect go out and tell some of this message to other people. Why isn't a non-native plant, if it's really site appropriate, and it's kind of appreciated by many of the natural creatures, why can't a non-native plant be just as good as a native plant? And for many years, with cooperative extension education, we would teach right plant, right place. It's really OK if it's non-native. And uh, as long as it's doing no harm and won't become an invasive plant. Come on in. There's lots of seats over this away. But here's the aha. And I wish I'd written the book, but I've probably sold more of this fellow's book. H how many of you have seen or read Bringing Nature Home? A couple of you have. That is the best book for ecological education. It's a good read. You can sell it to the garden club you're given a talk to. It, it truly speaks in regular language and tells people why the non-native plant even if it's doing no harm, isn't just as good. And the reason is, we need the insects. A land without insects is a land without higher forms of life. They are the basis of, it's not really the food chain, it's the food pyramid. And what do insects that eat plants need? The kind of plants they evolved with. Native insects need native plants. And what follows is, I end up talking to some garden club saying, you really want a lot of shrubs in your backyard that have a lot of holes in them because you've been feeding those native insects and you're doing a good job. That's a little tough sell. They have been groomed to think, no, we have to have the perfect rose with the perfect foliage. Holes are not acceptable. So teaching the world to say, let's feed the insects, at least the good ones, uh, that's a rather hard sell. But it's what we have to do, or ultimately we don't have the entire ecosystem that it's built upon. So which native plants do we need? I almost made and brought 
my favorite handouts that I have used in my region. And I have another fellow lecturer that has a similar list. And then I said, no, I'm, I'm kind of breaking the rule. You can find on the Ithaca website any number of lists of excellent native plants. And ideally, we should grow as many as we can of the plants right within our own 50 mile radius. Now, I'm not, again, expecting any of us to ever be purists. And when I get along further, I'm going to give us a goal individually. But what native plants we need, there are a few in New York State, or a few ways you can identify best plants. And I'm only going to say, don't forget the evergreens. I'm mostly going to show you burying, flowering plants, but don't forget the evergreens. The native juniper, for example, has a huge wildlife value because it's nesting and shelter, and for some plants, dining, and even berries. But berries really count. So if you go for your burying trees and shrub, all of these in your yard are very good and useful. Even the most urban of yards can have a service berry in the cor corner. I did notice that Sullivan Renaissance has this wonderful plant list. They're picks for Let's Beautify Sullivan County. And they're selling these great packages and making them available to you for your projects. And their shrub of the year is service berry. I didn't highlight it because Diana Weiner told me that. I highlighted it on my own previously because if there were one single plant everybody should have one of, it's a service berry because it's beautiful in the spring with flowers. The berries are beautiful and delicious in the summer. If you can get ahead of the birds, get some of them yourself. But even if you don't, you get the beauty of cedar wax wings, 20 at a time coming to eat the service berries. Uh, absolute joy. And a part of why we do all this is a little bit for the selfish joy that we get. But all of those burying shrubs, viburnums and winter berries, currants, choke, ba uh, choke berry, I'll show you that in a minute, blueberries. Vaccinium blueberry, if you can do an acidic location, I think your soils tend to be on the acidic side in parts of this county. They are a fine, fine plant to grow for yourself, for wildlife. But what people don't seem to know is there's this ornamental one that is gorgeous. There's, they all turn red in the fall. And now uh, some of the uh, proven winners are coming out with more ornamentally attractive uh, blueberries. And look at the color on that one. Would, and they tolerate shade. You wouldn't get as many berries in the shade, but wouldn't it be a beautiful plant just ornamentally? Elderberry, aronia. Here's one not enough people use. Aronia or chokeberry. Different from choke cherry. This is choke berry. And there are ones that are four feet tall and some that are six feet tall. I don't think they're individually perfect specimen plants, but as a cluster or a group, beautiful with fall color, dark berries, bird value, high vitamin C content. And interestingly, as the poor birds and even the deer toward this end of winter, what they need desperately are the shriveled up berries that remain, the vitamin C, the last of the sumac up in the woods, those red droops that they can't reach and they, they're way up there in terms of the uh, deer or other animals needing them. So one of the things we can do for wildlife is out in the woods, cut the sumac right down, let those droops fall on the ground where the animals who are really starving uh, can get them. Um, Aronia is a great plant in many ways, and that one you can naturalize or just enjoy the specimen. Oh, there's my sumac that goes with that story. Yeah, cut your sumac down in the woods. It'll come back, but let them fall, and it'll help animals that are, are distressed. I know that deer are a gardener's problem, but it's not their fault, and the ones that are out there starving and suffering, uh, letting them suffer further isn't helping the problem. We need to address the problem in bigger ways. 
uh, by how we plant, where we plant, whether we permit pre predators. It's obviously a complex situation and not easily solved. But the individual suffering, we can build brush piles, we can give them sumac tips, uh, we can do a few things that help. Viburnums, another wonderful plant, they have fallen out of disfavor. And new gardeners, serious gardeners, know there's this viburnum leaf beetle that came in in the last 10, 12, 14 years and decimated many of the native viburnums in our fields. And then people in the nurseries stopped selling any viburnums. Or master gardeners said, don't buy viburnums because of the viburnum leaf beetle. But there are many viburnums that do not fall victim to that particular beetle, the leather-leafed types. And if you go around Cornell uh, University, uh, you will see many that were hybridized there, or many uh, uh, in, the mo in the Brandywine Valley. There's one called Brandywine. I don't think I put my, pi oh yeah, no I didn't. I didn't put my Brandywine picture, but there are some leather-leaf viburnums that are outstanding with multiple seasons of beauty and a great joy to behold. Another native plant you can totally enjoy, Itea. Itea, the one you may know is Little Henry, but there's many other Henrys. Uh, Itea Henry I is one of the uh, species, but go for Itea. It's a tight little shrub, it flowers, it has fall color, it's a really good alternative to that naughty, naughty burning bush. A uh, burning bush that people love is truly a problem. It escapes into fields, it dominates, takes over where native shrubs belong. But the Itea is one, and the Aronia that I showed you, those are some great alternatives. Winterberry, Ilex verticillata. Now here's the question. What about cultivars? When the native plant people get up and give their education, they'll often say, you know, go for the species plant. Uh, the species plant before they hybridized, before they were selling the cultivar. And for the insects that eat these plants, remember those, we can't do it without the native insects. For the insects, indeed, many times the species is the way to go. But I talked to Doug Tallamy, and other entomologists asking, when is a cultivar okay? And he, they don't necessarily know entirely, but Dr. Tallamy said, we mostly think that the DNA in the hybrids, if the DNA is there, it's valid for those insects that eat those plants. So if you're trying to keep those native insects happy, it's okay if they're eating some of those cultivars, they're probably getting what they need. On the other hand, there are cultivars where, say some bird eats um, a, some kind of berry, and the hybrid is cultivated to be bigger, bigger berries, and the bird can't get in its mouth anymore. So sometimes the improved plant to please us isn't helping the, the native creature at all. And there's many other things, many flowers that their pollen and nectar were valuable for some insect or some pollinator. Uh, if they breed to get that nasty pollen that drops on the, on the tablecloth, if they try to get rid of the pollen and nectar and have all flowers but no pollen, well, obviously, they've undone the job. But I'll mention a couple of cultivars of native plants that are just so beautiful. I think I saw this shown downstairs in one of the displays, the Calacanthus um, Aphrodite. What a cultivar. It comes out of proven winners. And where the Calacanthus or Carolina allspice is sort of a five by five foot, pretty graceful shrub with glossy leaves, it used to have a very muddy maroon kind of flower that wasn't that impressive. But then they came along with Venus and Aphrodite and very uh, sweet sounding flowers that are indeed so much better. So there's a plant that's worth buying the cultivar of and you're still offering a few native insects something good to eat. And Chianthus in an acidic situation, another native plant that's rarely used, underutilized, underknown. So beyond the Norway maple, 
I know there's people who love their Norway maples, but do we really need more of the kind of tree that produce hundreds of seedlings per each individual, takes over forests and displaces the trees we should have in those forests, and everybody else has them anyway, so do we really need more Norway maples? There are other great native trees. We should be planting Acer saccharum, the sugar maples, Acer pennsylvanicum, Kentucky coffee tree. There are so many more. So look, if you're choosing, teach people that you influence. If you're choosing a tree for the backyard, go for a Kentucky coffee tree instead of just one more great big giant maple. And uh, similarly with front yard smaller trees, there's many other choices. Okay, I'm gonna take you a minute into the world of flowers. A butterfly garden, you know it when you see it. Lots of flowers. And it's very easy to uh, s serve the plants that need the pollen and nectar. You just need to provide a lot of flowers and you're doing the job. There's a few other things we need to do for our butterflies, sunshine, get the, the garden out of the wind, obviously not using the pesticide. The pollinators need pollen and nectar. And most of the pollinators aren't fussy about their pollen and nectar sources, so they'll drink at any bar. It's okay. But the hard old part with the butterfly world is just what I said about selling those garden club folks on having um, lots of holy leaves in their, in their backyard. We need the larval plants the plants like the Asclepias that the monarch butterfly has to have uh, as it flies through. We need larval plants, things like the spice bush. It's not a gorgeous plant, but it's the only food source for the spice bush butterfly. The, uh, the spice bush swallowtail butterfly absolutely has to find these plants along the way. So another one that it's subtle but it's important what we do. Joe Pieweed, Eupatorium, Vernonia. Does anybody have Vernonia? New York ironweed? You do, because that's, I've had a personal mission trying to push that plant and say to people, wow, a native plant, now the species plant is nine feet tall. I think I have a picture of, yeah, on, the le on, on your left, that's a little girl looking up at a nine foot uh, New York ironweed, and that's really how big it is. But there's a cultivar called iron butterfly that's just three feet and darling. I don't know if it's as valuable for all the creatures. I know that the pollinators still love it. But in any case, and on the other picture, I just wanted to make the point. Let me see, I think I have a, this is Rudbeckia herbstone a cultivar of a Rudbeckia, but boy, does that ever, um, it, you know, to, if you want to make butterflies happy, make a big splash. They'll see the yellow and they'll come. If there's one little yellow plant, maybe not so much. So provide the bigger size if you can. Obviously, what we need not to do, if you have a neighbor who's growing tea roses and is spraying or is, is hiring chem lawn to take care of a perfect lawn, don't bother having a butterfly garden. The drift is lethal. They cannot tolerate hardly any, any pesticide drift. And a few other things that people don't think about that we should do to have a more ecologically friendly yard, like dead trees. Uh, let a few dead trees stand. Now I don't mean if they're gonna fall on your car or if they're gonna land on your house in the next windstorm. Uh, but if it's in the back of the yard or the edge of the woods, I have known new people who moved to the country from somewhere in a suburb somewhere and tell me that when I was at Cooperative Extension that they wanted to clean up the woods. And clean up the woods, okay, what are you gonna do? Take away all the underbrush and uh, get those logs out of there. Get those logs out of there, ah, uh, what is a log? It's Mother Nature's bed and breakfast. It's where the insects are. It's a hollow place you hide if you're a bunny and the fox is coming. Uh, it's many, many things. It's where a bear can find beetles to eat. Uh, so leave the bed and breakfast. Let the dead trees stand. We call them a snag. Uh, many things we can do as part of tolerating. I think there's a messiness thing. A lot of people get into the 
it has to be neat or I'm not a good citizen. And sure, there's places where your front has to be clipped and you have to, there's neighborhood standards after all, but there's a place for messy. Maybe it's only your backyard. My wish would be that we could get everybody in a suburb to give back the last 22 feet in the back of the yard. And in some yards, if we had all strings of neighbors doing it, we'd have a wildlife corridor. We'd have a place where the grasses are this high and there's native shrubs with berries, things that don't get pruned into meatball shape and that actually a bird could live in and that beneficial insects could live in all year round and many species would be benefited. It won't help the forest bird that needs 10 square uh, miles or 10 square acres in order to establish residence, but it would help many, many kinds of creatures. So some of these rules are what we need to do. And the other thing that comes to me I'm kind of tying together here the idea that, first of all, if you build it, they will come. Where does a frog come from in the middle of the city, in these city gardens? How does a frog ever end up in the middle of a city garden? You know, nature is amazingly resourceful. Creatures will emerge if you plant it, especially if you and your neighbors plant it all in a corridor. But I started on this subject from a different back door, and I'm going to go back to the back door for just a minute. Uh, 24 years ago or something, I was becoming a master gardener and going to Cornell Extension and saying, I want to do things organically. And they treated me like I was a nutty hippie. Yeah. And you know what? That was not, except that was just, nope, you got to use seven. You got to spray seven for that and this and the other thing. And Cornell, the entire culture, it all has evolved. You can get wonderful education, and IPM is the foundation of education at Cornell for Master Gardeners now. But I wrote a book eventually for Rodale Books that they published it, and it was about biodiversity, the same thing we're talking about in our backyards. Give it trees, shrubs, perennials, flowers, lots of different kinds. To If you create a diverse garden, even a vegetable garden, uh, and, and what they wanted me to name it was something about companion gardening. And I said, you know, that one was written. Louise Riott wrote, roses love this and garlic loves that. And, you know, that wasn't a very scientifically founded book, but she only sold 300,000 or something like that. Uh, and when I started out with a companion topic, what does everybody think of? Oh, the marigolds. They're supposed to put marigolds around and they'll send away the insects. The bad insects won't come because of the marigolds. It really doesn't work like that. What it's really about is diversity to establish habitat for the flowers. The marigolds are a great flower to mix in there. They're a great nectar source. They are strong scented and indeed they can fuse some of the beetles that come in. In a patch of strongly scented, if you have lavender or some herbs or the marigolds, lots of insects don't approach your beans if they're surrounded by flowers. And that's kind of the idea with a companion garden. It's really all about the insects. This isn't your insect lecture, so I won't spend time on them, but you have great beetles working for you in a biodiverse garden or landscape. You have great bugs. There's a beetle. There's the star beetle. What is it? Lady beetle larva. There she is, lady beetle. You see those in a garden, and what would the average gardener do? It's dead. Yeah. But no, we're not going to kill that one. That's your friend. Great predatory bugs. The one pictured is one of my favorites, the ambush bug. It's an old photo, but there's a red eye, a black head, and great big forearms. It looks like this guy's been doing push-ups. It's a wrestling, wrestling beetle. And what the ambush bug does is it'll hunker down in a flower and something else will walk across the top and it leaps out and grabs. So it's the ambush bug, sneaky little fellow. But he's all of a sixteenth of an inch high. And you might see him on asters in your field. If you pick up New York or New England asters out of the field, 
Look for little tiny insects. You see the red eye and the black head? That's your ambush bug. But there's so many of these out there. Other predatory insects. The message is there's a lot of these guys working for you if you build it. If you build it, they will come. You need to provide nectar. Back to the nectar. You need to provide uh, lacy plants that the uh, parasitoid wasps love. So the aster family, the umbel, umbeliferae, the umbel plants. I think that's my husband inspecting some uh, wonderful gardens in Buffalo. One of them lets the um, New England, uh, what am I trying, Queen Anne's lace appear here and there. And they're beautiful waving above a garden. I pity him if he has to dig them out once in a while, but there they are. There's my companion garden uh, some years back. I'm not doing that anymore because you can't do everything at all times in your life. But I had uh, many. And there's a California companion garden. I had been doing an HD, HGTV special about companion gardening out in California. And uh, there was this acres and acres of gardens that look just like mine with messiness, with flowers, herbs, all mixed in with the vegetables. And it was humming and buzzing and jumping, noisy, fluttering. It was the most wonderfully active, alive place. And that's different from that neatness paradigm of the American vegetable garden with a single row and then soil, single row. No, let's get our gardens busier, tighter, crowdeder, just like that backyard that I was suggesting would be a little more messy. Buffalo has come a long way. Uh, we have so many flowering front yards now. It's becoming a mecca. So that's the message in that, that regard, and I want to encourage you all to think organic, think nature friendly. Uh, I appreciated a message this morning. It said we don't have much time. We really don't have much time. And part of what we're losing the battle fast is simply the uh, natural habitat battle. Uh, we need to, let's have a goal. Okay, I write for the Buffalo News. And my message in the Buffalo News, as often as I can smash it into one topic or another, is let's plant 20% native plants in each of our yards. If we all just do 20%, that's not a purest, difficult goal. There's so many flowers and shrubs that would meet that goal. And then let's lay them out in a friendly way. Let's have them in islands and clusters, and that back 20 feet or a hedgerow. Have them in ways that, that do foster habitats of other living things. That is my mother, and she is now 97. She's still putting at the putting green. I can't say it's because she ate organic her whole life. It isn't. But uh, sometimes we're just lucky. But it's a goal. I'm not, uh, I, by the way, I've taken on a job with AAA doing garden discovery tours. And some of them are to the Buffalo Gardens, uh, Garden Walk Buffalo. And we have a um, thousand private gardens that are open to the public, sometimes during a six-week period. And people are coming by the busload. And if at any point some of you want to organize something, I have my informational sheet about those down there. And I could be happy to host you or and sometimes share what we're doing in Buffalo. I love what's happening here in Sullivan County, but not every county will have a Renaissance Corporation uh, giving back to the extent that the uh, Garys are doing. And uh, not every county has that, but we're trying to, in a different way, build in the revitalization through garden tourism. It's another path to some of the same good goals, but Garden Walk Buffalo is just filled with scenes like this and their backyards that you won't believe. That's just one street where people, they all do that. And we've been in 50 national magazines. You know, what do you think of when I say Buffalo? What's the first word? Snow. Yeah, see, snow. And the, probably the second word is something you eat. Chicken wings, great. Yeah, so snow and chicken wings, let's be famous for that. Uh, instead, we're trying to change the concept and say, no, it's about those buffalo gardens. We've actually been in 50 magazines like the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle for this gardening thing. And, uh, in, and the newer demographic doing these urban front yards 
they also want to be organic. They're trying to do it with dense clusters of flowers all packed, and some of those backyards are 20 feet by 30 feet, and they're dense with layered plantings. Pretty special. Yeah, just some more hints and scenes from a couple of them. Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave on that one with just, just my message that if you plant it, they will come. And I guess in this sense, I mean two things. The tourists will come, but also so will the beneficial insects and so will the bluebirds and some of the critters that we really, really need to help. Time is running out, but if we all do 20%. What that Dr. Tallamy taught in that book, I don't think I finished the thought, was that not only do we need those native plants for the DNA and all of those other reasons, if we in the suburbs and cities don't do it, it won't be done because there isn't enough farmland left to grow back into appropriate habitat. There aren't enough field and forest. Statistically, if we dwellers in two acre plots and one acre plots don't do it, it won't get done. So that's my message. I hope you all go out and plant some native plants this season and keep on doing what you're doing in Liv Livingston County. Thank you. Yeah, Sullivan County, I knew that. I haven't even been in that other county. If you ha I'll be glad to take a couple of questions. If you do happen to want my book to, s to help anybody else become a vegetable gardener in an organic way, I sell it to my friends and family for $15, and you're my friends. So it's down there. Yes, you have a question. Yes, what do you do about deer? <laughs> what do you do about deer? Of course, that's a always question, and there is... There, if I had an easy answer, that would be great. I tolerate a lot, and I make a lot of careful plant selection. And I'm lucky, because I have a country property, so I can have area where they can eat what they want. And up close to my house, I take a risk on some plants. And sometimes I lose, and sometimes I don't. So I think deer or other critters-wise, tolerance has to be a part of us gardeners. Now, if you have the farm, you can't tolerate. Ultimately, with deer, it has to be larger social management. It has to be uh, protection of habitat. Keep uh, Country owners keep the habitat you have. Hunters are probably part of the solution, although I would never kill anything, and I don't let them hunt on my yard. On my land, I have a balance with my deer. But where they are overpopulated, it's, it's obviously because the entire country is out of balance. Our entire ecosystem is shot. So we have to figure out tolerance in some places, limiting the population in other places, fencing your own particular yard, work with the repellents if you particularly want to protect this. So somewhere between the repellents and the fencing is all we have. And after that, we need much larger solutions. And it's not something I have a true, there's no simple answer. So somebody else, something I can solve. Yes. On um, one of your slides, you had a, a fence that had a sign that said certified wildlife habitat. Yes. Yes, I think that you certified wildlife habitat is through the USDA, I think. I, if you just look up cert wildlife federation, thank you. Do you have a habitat that you certify? Yeah, it's a great thing. There's a certified wildlife habitat through the Wildlife Federation of America. And it's it's good thing to do. Obviously, it's what many of you are doing anyway. You need to have provided water, certain kinds of plants, certain arrangements, so you have clusters of safety for birds, things like that. But it's very doable, not that difficult. And it's a nice message to other people that this matters to you. A few, even buffalo gardens have become a certified wildlife habitat, because even in a small space, you can achieve the density of planting that will be valid for that. Something else? If you're um, a renter, not a home owner, so you want to, you doubt, um, I, I doubt a little bit of gardening, but I'm not going to do major investment in plants. Are there any recommendations? If you're a renter and not a homeowner, what can you do and maybe take it? I think there's some things worth planting that you leave behind. Leave them a service berry, whether they wanted one or not. <laughs> And while you're there for three years, it will become a beautiful, leave them an elderberry. But 
do a lot of large container planting that you can take with you. And maybe it isn't perennials for a few years. Maybe it's one perennial in the center of a big pot and the rest annuals. But even with annuals, you can make a difference. And you can have an entire garden of movable. I've seen lots of creative gardeners in urban settings, sometimes with movable large planters on wheels. Even people with wagons that plant the wagons make drainage and pull them around to where the sun is. So creatively, there's always a way to do some gardening. And, and we'll all get old someday, and I'll need to do more and more raised beds and portable containers and things like that, too. So there's some ways you can help. And then you'll have a, a home someday, maybe permanently, that you can do the rest of it. So one more question. Two more. Yes. Yes, many say beau fleu, others said beau fleu, which is river. So it could be either way. I don't know, but yeah, thank you. Buffalo is flowering. It's not those darn chicken wings. Yes. Not wheat. Oh. There's no way to get rid Japanese knotweed, and he's on the river. And we have a Buffalo River Creepers group that is you know, a big organization. It'll take on this five miles for two weekends and hundreds of volunteers. And it sometimes involves lethal, I mean, very dense um, roundup, the stuff that's not good in many other ways. But sometimes you have to use big guns to get rid of a big problem. I don't know. Yeah, that's the thing. Those, those invasive plants, if we can prevent them by not buying the next one, and not having the nursery selling the next kind of plant that's so that it's not easy. I think I'll let you go because we have lots more to do today. And I thank you very much for your time. And I'll be down here if you want to chat. Thank you.